What are the features that you have to discussion on law and order protests in Turkey. Uh, we very much appreciate you coming. My name is Ida Mantika and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. Um, first of all, I would like to start by introducing our panel. If, if our panelists can introduce themselves very briefly, one by one. Uh, good, uh, good evening, my name is Holly Schistler. I'm uh, in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. I'm in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Uh, my area of research interest the late Ottoman Empire and early years of the Turkish Republic. Uh, my name is Kerem Shoklin. I'm an MA student in anthropology in the University of Chicago. Uh, my research interest is in Jewish politics, crime, and social policing in Turkey. Hey, uh, I'm Uli Dostum Numan in history, a graduate student, and uh, I work on 16th century Ottoman uh, material, but I'm also an activist involved in urban transformation in Istanbul and all other things. Um, so my name is Rob Jennings. I'm a PhD student in anthropology and European languages and civilizations. Um, I do archaeology in Turkey, uh, Hatay province, and uh, Yozgat province, among other places. I've also been involved in an activism in the United States, Occupy Wall Street movement. So uh, I was invited here by uh, the student party. My name is Nal Zijan. Uh, I'm a first year student student at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Erol Ülker and a PhD student in history. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd like to talk about the format of our event very briefly. Um, we're going to start with a senior friend of ours, a TSA member, a Turkish Student Association member, Utsuj, who's going to talk about um, the, the, the format of the, the political system in Turkey a little bit to inform you guys and sort of provide a bit of context um, as to what really happened in Turkey and what keeps and what is um, currently happening in Turkey. Um, so Utsuj, if you could please come to the <coughs> Hey everyone. Um, first of all, we'd like to give you some brief information uh, about Turkey's um, political background. Uh, the current party is Justice and Development Party. Um, Turkey, first of all, has a parliamentary system. The parliament is called Grand National Assembly of Turkey. Uh, the current government, uh, Justice and Development of Party, came to power in 2002 uh, with 34.26% uh, of the votes and followed by an election in 2007, uh, their votes increased to 46.58%. And there was another election in 2011, and the votes were 49.83%. And this party is an um, Islamic-oriented party, known for its economic liberalism and social conservatism policies. Um, they can be considered center-right conservative in Turkey. Recep Tayyip Erdogan is the Prime Minister and Chairman of AKP, and Abdullah Gül is the President of Turkey. Uh, we'd like to give you some background on what's going on in Turkey right now. We have a timeline of events. This picture is like a symbolic picture of the, the protests. So the event started on May uh, 28. Approximately 50 protesters gathered in Gezi Park, which is the only remaining green area in the city center of Istanbul. The main aim was to protest its planned demolition and the plan of building a new shopping mall to Gezi Park area. The outskirts of the park were demolished, although bulldozing stopped after the prominent public figure and the parliament member, Sarı Suraya Ondar, stepped in. Tear gas had been used on peaceful protests, which is likely to have sparked the growth of the protests. On May 29, the following day, the protest grew to show support and stand guard for the uh, park and demolition. 
tents were set up with plans for peaceful put in place. The protesters had planned a pre press conference for the following day at 12.30 p.m., a concert at 6 p.m., and a movie screening at 10 p.m. Politicians, celebrities, and other prominent figures of Turkey showed, showed up with their support. May 30th. At the early hours of the day, the riot police started to use tear gas and water cannons to disperse the protesters away from the park, which they barricaded <coughs> the to. They also burned their tents. Over 100 people got injured, who were reported due to usage of tear gas and water cannons. At the end of the day, the voluntary doctors around the Taksim Square reported that there were over 1,000 injuries due to the excessive force used by the police. During the Taksim events, the mainstream media of Turkey remained silent. They didn't broadcast the brutality of the police. Nothing has been reported on the well-known channels. However, Hulk TV, which has comparatively low ratings, sustained its broadcasting, which completely consists of the Taksim events. <coughs> May 31st, the protests spread to other cities around Turkey. Support to the Gezi Park resistance started from Ankara and Izmir to, the, to whole Turkey. In Ankara, the protesters gathered around Kuldu Park, Tunus, uh, Beştakar streets, Bivan Park, Meşrutiyet, and Kızılay. In Izmir, Alsancak was the center point of the supporters to Gezi Park. This girl in the picture became the symbol of protests. Um, uh, a Turkish riot policeman used tear gas as people protested against the destruction of trees in a park both by the pedestrian project in Taksim Square and Central. So, what did our Prime Minister say about the protests? So they called the protesters Chapuzlar, uh, which means like looters. Um, he said, anyone who drinks alcohol is alcoholic, Tw Twitter is a play. Uh, he said, we're forcing the other half of the country to stay at home. If you can collect uh, 100,000 people, I can collect 1 million of them. So the protests and brutality of police continued at the fourth day. And uh, the morning of 31st, <coughs> May 31st, thousands of protesters walked over the Bosphorus Bridge because the public transport was not available. In the afternoon, the police retreated from taxi and allowed the protesters to remain there in peace. However, up to that point, there had been many injuries and brutal attacks on the police. June 1st. In Ankara, there has been very large protests, which is said to be with the attendance of 10,000 protesters. The protesters <coughs> walked aiming the national building. On June 1st, the protests uh, spread all over Turkey. The main problem with the protesters was still the excessive brutality of the police, and the common slogans were to resign of the government. June 2nd. So many tweets and Facebook status messages spread during the protest saying that the police used a gas called Agent Orange. Uh, this was known as a toxic chemical substance that has been terrible consequences in Vietnam War. However, was it really true that the police used Agent Orange? Unfortunately um, not. Police didn't use Agent Orange. A report by a group of experts refuted this thing. Um, as you can see, finding information is very hard these days because the mass media doesn't show anything, so people always learn things from Twitter and Facebook and some information were probably not correct. Day 5 has seen the largest protest yet. The morning was calm at Istanbul. The protesters were gathered to clean up, to clean up what was left uh, the night before. Reports on social media from Ankara and Izmir show that, suggest, show that violent clashes between police officers and protesters and a third group who were the AKP supporters is reported to be supporting the police. June 3rd, um, the protests continued with growing population and the police brutality on 7th and 8th days. The act of the police officers hardly changed, especially in Ankara. However, in some districts of Turkey, police officers approached the protesters very kindly and they put some uh, effort to distinguish between the innocent <coughs> and the provocateurs. President Abdullah Gül held a press conference and gave a softening and prudent speech. Uh, we got your message. However, Taif Erdogan remained quite persistent about the protest, and he didn't make any response statement. So what happened um, after the 4th? Basically, on the 5th, 
Prime Minister Erdogan left the country. He went to a trip to Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, and the Muslim <coughs> king refused to talk to him. Um, he participated in business forums in all three countries, and there were demonstrations in Tunisia. Uh, on the 6th, which was yesterday, um, Erdogan uh, came back to Turkey, and uh, according to BBC, 10,000 people greeted him at the airport, um, and he blamed the demonstrators as interest rate lobbyists. Um, they, they, he said these protests were unlawful and undemocratic, and um, he said most uh, of the people who were injured were policemen, and there were over 1,000. And recently, he gave another speech. He said that this movement was similar to Occupy Wall Street. And he said that 17 people died in Occupy Wall Street and that these kinds of protests can happen in democratic com their countries. However, uh, American embassy quickly responded saying that this is incorrect. Uh, 17 people did not die. And he's, Erdogan still said we won't pull back the police. Uh, he said these are the people who didn't get what they wanted um, during the election, so they're protesting. And he kind of tried to politicize the entire movement. And he also made a statement saying that he still wants this project to happen. Um, not a shopping mall, but a historical building instead. So these are all the events that have happened so far. Uh, just a brief information. I'm sure the panelists will enlighten you more. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Uti. Um, I think we should start our panel. Um, as, a, as a first point of discussion, if you'd like to start with the retrospective look on how things progress to the way, um, uh, to how they led to, to occur on May 28th, and, um, I'd like to take the floor. Sure. I'll use my. I don't choke to death. I'll be happy to. Um, on the other hand, I could just swallow backwards and kill myself, and that would be it. Um, so, at that, I mean, there's a. The, 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 the question that all historians uh, uh, have to confront is you know, say, oh, just begin at the beginning. What's the beginning? Uh, and uh, we can kind of go back in an infinite regress. Uh, but I, I think I, I would like to take as a beginning point the opening of the new millennium, really, the sort of 2001 uh, um, uh, moment as a, as a place to start the conversation. And just to say that um, uh, in 2001, Turkey underwent a very, very bad economic crisis, a, a really severe economic crisis, which was largely, I mean, which, uh, which we pay very little attention to in this country because, um, in, in one thing, partially because it's just sort of peripheral to something that people in the United States would pay attention to, and partly because, obviously, in the autumn of that year, there were the attacks on, the, on New York and uh, Washington, and everybody's attention got focused on that. But in the spring and summer of 2001, uh, Turkey was undergoing a, 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 an economic crisis that what was already an extraordinary economy and made it a zillion times worse. Uh, and there was a, a devaluation of the currency in a way that, that made it so that people lost essentially a lifetime's worth of savings. Um, and it wasn't the first time that that had happened. Uh, that is, for people of a, of a certain generation, that could easily have been the third time in their adult lives uh, that uh, a financial, uh, that a very bad financial crisis of that kind of that kind had caused them to lose everything. And um, I happened to be in Turkey that summer and traveled some outside of Istanbul uh, in central and northeastern Turkey. And I can say that the, that the tone, the general tone around the country was quite desperate. I mean, there was a lot of desperation in, in Istanbul proper, but as in all countries, the big metropolitan areas are privileged in some ways uh, and, 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 and sheltered in some ways from the severity of these kinds of crises. But in, Provincial centers and in rural areas, um, it, it bites even harder. Um, and uh, so there was a kind of desperation in the air and, and fury. 
um, and I want to I want to take as a starting point for for this story that fury. And I think people were profoundly enraged uh, that they, that they were living in a country that, for whatever reason, from their, the way that they felt about it in that moment, was you know what is wrong with our government and why can't they get it together? Like why are we being put through this process of working hard? And, 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 you know, the kind of rhetoric that we sometimes uh, hear from politicians in this country, if you work hard and do everything right, you should and play by the rules, you should be able to get ahead, right? Um, uh, the, the sense that people had that they had worked really hard and, 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 uh, and had, you know, scraped something together and they were beginning to get ahead and then they lost it all through things that had nothing to do with them, through, uh, expo you know, popping of financial bubbles and, um, rampaging inflation and a sense that they were governed by successive governments that were incompetent at some level and also corrupt and that there was an elite sort of ruling class that that was formulated into a variety of political parties along a relatively narrow political spectrum because there had been a military coup d'etat in 1980 which meant that there was no meaningful left in Turkey at all. You know, so that the political spectrum is sort of um, uh, uh, center right to right right, and um, um, you know, and, and that the, the kinds of people who were the political leaders of those parties, while they certainly had old and entrenched rivalries and hatreds and patronage networks and so on and so forth, that it was, it was old and stale and dysfunctional, and there wasn't a good alternative, and nobody had any to offer that was going to really pull the country out of this extremely painful place. And I, I can't emphasize this enough, because I, I think it's really important uh, how frustrated, I mean, there were, there were frustrations that had to do with, you know, other kinds of things, identity and freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and those are important too. And I don't want to belittle the importance of that, but I really want to say that, that, that there was a kind of desperation of, of that people felt about an inability to lead normal day-to-day -day lives and have some security that in, in pursuing a career, pursuing a job, or doing whatever, you know, that they're just doing normal things, that they were going to be able to get ahead or even keep their noses on the waterline. Right? And, and provide something for their families thereafter. And that climate of disillusion and, and rage, real rage, um, and it was shocking to me how angry people were when I got out into the countryside and they could talk to me because I was a stranger, and, you know, and so people could sort of talk to you in an unedited way because who am I going to tell, right? Um, uh, uh, but really, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, much later I'm going to tell you, but, uh, um, you know, the, 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 that, the, so it's, it's on the heels of that that we come to the election that brings the occupied power. And that's important because in the year, in the run up to that, in the years preceding that, there had been slowly growing uh, a, a kind of socio-political movement uh, and I say socio-political because it partially constituted as, po as, political, as political parties who were running for office, but partially, but much more importantly, probably constituted as social movements in neighborhoods that were offering uh, a sense of community and, and social welfare and, and uh, community support. Um, uh, there was a kind of growing socio and political movement in different parts of Turkey with a religious orientation. And within that movement, there were different stripes too. You shouldn't think of it as a model, but there, there were different, you know, different people with different perspectives within what I would call the religious uh, movement. But um, those uh, people who had largely been excluded from open uh, political uh, uh, activity prior to the 19, uh, to the mid to late 1980s, and towards whom there had been a slight softening or a slight opening of the political um, uh, arena following the uh, reconstitution of, of uh, democratic politics after the, after the end of the Evren uh, uh, dictatorship. Um, they had had, they had been very successful at organizing, organizing kind of social welfare networks and neighborhoods. 
And they had also been very successful in local politics in, in coming and getting elected as mayors of cities, including ultimately Istanbul. Um, and they had run on a ticket, not so much, I mean, maybe to their own constituencies, they had run on a ticket of religiosity, but to the, to the wider, to, but both to their own constituents and to a wider public, they had run on a ticket of, we're different. We're new brooms that are going to sweep clean. We're not the same old hack politicians that, that you've had for decade after decade who have never managed to sort of get it together uh, in this country. We are uh, efficient. We we'll get the job done. And we're clean. Uh, we're not engaged in the kind of old school patronage and corruption networks uh, uh, that have characterized in, in that had characterized, or that people felt had characterized the preceding governments. You know, that all those years, really after, since the end of the Turgos-Bozal period, right, all those, you know, the, the Tansu Chilera period, all of that, that, that people really felt so strongly uh, were, were just whacked by corruption and, and people you know, mining their own pockets in the pockets of their friends, right? Uh, we don't do that. We're, we're, we're something else. We're something new. And uh, when, uh, uh, so that the elections in, I think it was 2002, I guess, uh, that the, the first elections of the AKP really came to power, I think they ran on that ticket and they cashed it and they, and they, and they tapped into that rage that people had. And a lot of folks voted for them. Uh, people voted for them because they were, some people, many people voted for them because they had a kind of, um, uh, religious or moral uh, connection to the, um, to the Islamically rooted program that the Islamic group grew up with. And a lot of other people voted for them because they voted for them because they were fed up uh, uh, with, with what they had been, um, what they had to put up with uh, uh, previously. And they really, you know, they wanted a change. <laughs> um, and when the AKP came to power, uh, in the early years, um, they had many achievements. Whether you want to give them, whether you want to credit them with that achievement, or whether you want to say that they actually were the architects of those achievements or not, and you can debate about that, and I'm not going to make a judgment about it. But I'm going to say, whether you think they were genuinely the architects of it, or whether you think they were lucky enough to benefit from certain historical conjunctures, the fact of the matter is that a number of uh, very positive things started to happen little by little. So gradually. It took some time, but gradually that inflation was gotten under control. And the money was revalued. And actually, because the crisis of 2001 had largely been a banking crisis, uh, then in that moment, Turkey undertook serious bank uh, and financial regulation and reform in a way that has meant that in the crisis of 2007 and 2008, Turkey has fared very well. Uh, because we didn't have the weaknesses in our credit system, that, for example, we had. Uh, so while the rest of the world was crashing and burning, especially the Turkish economy was growing in a rather spectacular way. Uh, uh, so they, there are real economic gains that Turkey has made in the last decade that ordinary people do perceive in their ordinary lives. And, and they, those are achievements that cannot be denied. Uh, that, that is the meaning and effect of those achievements in people's lives cannot be denied. And we do well to not take them lightly. Um, the second thing is that the, the AKP offered initially, especially, an opening for conversation about a series of topics that up until that moment had been sort of taboo topics. Um, why they did that and what their intentions were in doing that are, again, a, a sort of a matter that is open to interpretation. And I have my views about that, which I will share with you. But they did make it possible, really for the almost the first time uh, in modern, I think, in modern Turkish history, to talk about very difficult and painful subjects like uh, trying to seriously look at the, the history and origins of what had been essentially an ongoing civil war between the Turkish state and some elements of the Kurdish population in the east, 
uh, discriminatory uh, treatment of Kurds and of the Kurdish language in, in, in Turkey more broadly. Um, uh, the question of the fate of Ottoman Armenians and uh, you know what 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 actually had happened during World War One uh, to the Armenian population, um, and also um, although this took longer, they did address the, some of the abuses of the of the military during various coup d'état that had taken place uh, across the mid and uh, 20th century. In the disappearances of people, the overthrowing of the government, torture, etc. Um, and these were all topics that, uh, prior to that time, had really been untouchable topics. You know, that was, you couldn't, you could, be, you was, you, there just wasn't a way to talk about those things in a public forum. I mean, people would talk about it in private, but they couldn't talk about it in public. So. And so you really did see and explore, and, and I don't mean, by the way, saying that you could begin to talk about it didn't mean it was easy or unproblematic or safe to talk about it, okay? People who started to talk about things, those things were put under real pressure, uh, and it was scary. But it was possible, and the fact that it was possible was something new under the sun, it really was. So suddenly you did breathe this certain air uh, coming to Istanbul, and I think it's noticeable to me as somebody who would come and then go and then, you know, uh, come and go. If you come one summer, it's like, wow, this is really different. There are uh, like five, ten new newspapers, different from the old ones that have always been there, and they're kind of expressing different points of view, and there's this very vibrant publishing thing, and, like you went to the bookstores, and it was like, stop publishing, I can't read that fast. <laughs> you know, um, it, seriously, though, I mean, it was, it was very noticeable explosive change in print culture and in cafe society uh, and people, you know, uh, talking about things um, and, and, and a growing kind of economic self-confidence, uh, and, and all of which was really terrific and all of which countries like, places like the European Union and the United States took note of in a very sort of, uh, you know, positive way, like, that's great, Turkey is opening, Turkey is democracy, you know, onward and upward kind of thing. And what I think is lost in that story, perhaps, uh, and now we're getting to the thing that is more my personal interpretation, is that, you know, the, the, Opening up to the, to, to the ability to, to address some of these issues. One way to look at that is that you, a general commitment is being made to open civil society and democratization. <coughs> but another way to look at that, and maybe both are true at the same time, uh, is that you're attacking as the new party in power, and the party that represents something very ideologically different from the previous 70 years. Um, uh, you're, you're attacking some of the things that were the sacred cows of the old government. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, okay? So if, the, if, if under the old ideological order uh, some of these issues were taboo, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to challenge those taboos. But you can challenge those taboos because what you want to create is an open society. But you can also challenge those taboos because what you want to do is undermine the legitimacy of the old order. Um, and uh, uh, I, in, initially, I think it was an open question how that was going to be. But as things have evolved in Turkey, I have to say that I have been increasingly uh, uh, of the opinion that what was really going on was a desire to undermine the old order more so than a desire to create a genuinely open society. And that has been extremely worrisome. And you can really see that in the, um, uh, well, you can see that in a variety of ways. One thing is that the, the openness to the discussion of some of these issues is beginning to evaporate. So um, the uh, widespread arrests of the military, uh, of military men, which are widely applauded in the Western press as, oh, the civil society in Turkey is bringing the military to heel are so broad and so sweeping that I think they have to be understood not as bringing the military to heel, but as purging the military preparatory to staffing it with your own royal cadres. Uh, 
the increasing use of police forces, uh, and use of police forces and strengthening of police forces at the expense of the military actually shows you something else, I think, as well. Um, um, and additionally, for example, um, uh, the, um, there's a sort of rhetoric of opening towards the Kurds, but at the same time, large numbers of people are being arrested and put on trial for having contact with or supporting a secret uh, a terrorist organization. So they're, they're at the same time that there's a kind of rhetoric of opening towards the Kurds, and some very positive steps, like the allowing of publication and news media in Kurdish. You know, a lot of people who worked for a lot of years to achieve those things when it wasn't easy to work for those things and to advocate for those things are being rounded up and arrested and put on trial uh, uh, as sort of uh, having contact with treasonous organizations. And so there's a very mixed message there. Um, issues like, you know, the, the kinds of issues that people like to focus on, which are like the sort of so social slash religious issues like sales of alcohol and veiling and unveiling. Um, I think, you know, that one has to understand that those are ideological flashpoints, and they have been for a long time, but that people get upset about them, like they get upset about the question of where, when and where and how much alcohol can be consumed and how much it's going to cost, not because they care so much about alcohol per se, but because they see those things as um, uh, uh, symbolic markers about the question of uh, where the, uh, the right of the state to intrude into your personal life begins and ends. Uh, and um, that's, uh, that's significant too. So I think that people feel very strongly that, that, that something that started out looking like an open, the, the strengthening of civil society and a democratic opening is beginning to look more and more like st substituting one group of um, uh, cronies for a different one um, with, it, with a different social and political agenda, but, but with many similar characteristics, a tendency towards authoritarianism, a desire to impose their own moral and ethical codes on society as a whole, um, um, a, Turkey now has more journalists in prison.